Welcome to the City Club of Eugene's June 12th, 2020 program, Gun Violence, a Public Health Crisis. This is the 35th program for our 2019-20 programming year. My name is Scott Coltrane, and I'm the City Club President. Support for the City Club is provided by our members and sponsors. You can become a member of the City Club at our website, cityclubofeugene.org. We have both business and in-kind sponsors, including our diamond sponsors. Kaiser Permanente exists to provide high quality, affordable healthcare services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information at www.kp.org. Support comes from the University of Oregon. Since 1876, the U of O has helped Oregon, or, Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically. More information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health is proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond. As your hometown, hometown health care partner for more than 80 years, our mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. It provides comprehensive, accessible, high quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. We would also like to acknowledge the generous support from the city of Eugene and from Lane County. Now about today's program on gun violence as a public health issue. The toll of American gun violence is horrific and it is on the rise. In 2017, gun deaths reached their highest level since 1968, with almost 40,000 deaths or over 100 per day. Over a million Americans have been shot in the past decade. The statistics are even worse for communities of color. Black men make up 52% of all gun homicide victims, despite comprising less than 7% of the US population. Black Americans are 10 times more likely than white Americans to die by gun homicide and 14 times more likely to be injured by a gun assault. To date, gun violence has been considered primarily a law enforcement issue. Would it make more sense to study the problem as a public health issue, seeking causes and solutions for the carnage? In this program, national experts discuss what can be achieved if we treat gun violence as a public health problem. The panel will examine the impact of gun violence on communities, school shootings, connections with law enforcement, and legislation at the state and local levels. I would like to thank the City Club of Eugene's past president and chair of the program committee, Joel Corrin, for organizing today's session. Our speakers today will include Kathleen Carlson, Paul Boxer, Jeffrey Sprague, and Allison Anderman. Kathleen Carlson earned a Bachelor of Science degree from Oregon State University and a PhD from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. She is currently Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Joint Oregon Health and Science University and Portland State University School of Public Health and a core investigator with the Health Services Research Center of Innovation at the VA Portland Healthcare System. Dr. Carlson leads the Gun Violence as a Public Health Issue Workgroup at OHSUPSU. Her research examines the spectrum of injury prevention and control approaches, from the epidemiology of intentional and unintentional injuries to the rehabilitation of military veterans with combat injuries. Paul Boxer earned a BA from Williams College and a PhD in clinical psychology from Bowling Green State University. He's the director of the Rutgers Center on Youth Violence and Juvenile Justice and a professor of psychology at Rutgers Newark. Dr. Boxer's work focuses on the development, prevention, and treatment of violent and nonviolent antisocial behavior. He is currently studying evidence based practices in the juvenile justice system, the impact of community violence and crime on youth development, and the role of youth gangs in the development and persistence of antisocial behavior. Jeffrey Sprague earned bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in special education from the University of Oregon. 
He's a professor of special education and the director of the University of Oregon Institute on Violence and Destructive Behavior. Jeff has written books for educators on crime prevention and school safety, and is a nationally recognized expert on school violence, school safety, positive behavior interventions, multi-tiered support systems, alternative education, and juvenile delinquency prevention and treatment. Allison Anderman earned a law degree from the University of San Francisco. She is senior counsel at Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, which she joined in 2014. She consults with cities and counties around the country, aiming to enact effective local gun safety laws and pass extreme risk protection order legislation. Anderman writes Gun Law Trend Watch for the Giffords Law Center. She has analyzed and debated gun laws on CNN, HuffPost Live, NPR, KQED in San Francisco, and KCRW in Los Angeles. Her opinions are quoted extensively in the press, including by the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Newsweek, and The Guardian. On to today's program. Kathleen Carlson, we will begin with you. Well, thank you so much for having us here today to address firearms and gun violence as a public health issue. Firearm deaths and injuries are one of the most important issues of our time, but also one that we have the tools to address, like many of us here are doing. Just to give a little bit of a personal background, I grew up in Vanita, about 15 minutes west of Eugene, and home of the Oregon Country Fair. And like many here, guns were a part of our everyday lives. They were used for recreation, like trap and target shooting, hunting, pheasant, deer, yellow-bellied marmots in the east, property maintenance to get those moles, and for safety. My family's long guns were stored leaning against the wall behind my dad's dresser, and the handguns and ammo were stored in the top dresser drawer. Handguns empowered my mom to take us anywhere in Oregon, out to my brother and I's sports tournaments, county fairs, hiking, mushrooming, and so on knowing that she could protect herself and her kids in strange situ situations, which were not all that uncommon. This was, of course, before cell phones, and in many ways, cell phones have helped fill this need for a sense of security. But to this day, there are many times when I even find myself in a threatening situation and have this feeling that I wish I were carrying a handgun, just like my mom did, for that safe sense of independence and security. But I also know that my carrying a handgun or keeping our firearms in our household risk than a benefit to me and to my family and my community. So as a wide-eyed idealist do-gooder in my early 20s, just after finishing school at OSU, I began graduate school in public health because I wanted to save lives, mainly to cure cancer, make people's lives better and longer, and eradicate inequities in health and opportunity across the world. But quickly, I realized that if I focused on injury, which is the number one killer of people under 45 years of age, that that might be my best bet in actually making a difference. So I spent six years of graduate training in injury epidemiology, studying children's injury prevention and occupational safety and health. And since that time, like everyone here, I've been acutely aware of guns as a primary source of injury, an epidemic. And I'm absolutely heartbroken each and every time I read of a school shooting, a mass shooting, police shootings, toddler shooting, suicide, or gang violence, yet also acutely aware that gun injuries, just like all injuries, are predictable, and that makes them preventable. You can imagine the colorful conversations I've had with my parents about gun safety and gun legislation, debates about the NRA and gun laws, Oregon legislation, and even who will inherit my family's prized firearms. But also, we've looked personal tragedy. In 2013, we lost my grandfather, a World War II veteran who lived right down the road from my parents who were then in sweet home to firearm suicide. And I remember my dad's call that morning where I cried out to him, I told you to remove the guns from his house. And my dad sadly responding, my dear, we couldn't take all of the man's guns. So again, the sense of security and maybe for an aging man, the last thread of independence. So in my current research involving firearm injury, I bring with me this part of my fabric understanding of the importance of guns to our history and our culture, to our families and our communities, but also intertwined with a deep sorrow for the loss of life we all experience in exchange for this benefit. And I'm not unique in this approach to the public health of firearm injury and gun violence, which is why I wanted to share my personal story with you. 
because too often this issue is framed as a binary gun rights versus gun control issue. And it's simply not the case for me or for others of us in public health who wish to improve the health and longevity and equity across our population. Our approach is to study and understand ways that we can reduce the toll of firearm injuries on all of our families, whether through better policies, education, technology, or even by changing the social norms that lead us to needing guns to feel safe and independent in the first place, while preserving individual rights and decreasing unintended consequences of these interventions. It's a harm reduction approach and it works, but we have to invest in the research, the trial and error, and finding solutions to this problem. So now I personally know the feeling of having lost someone very dear to me due to gun violence. I haven't experienced a loved one dying by motor vehicle crashes, but I have experienced a loved one dying by the barrel of a gun. And this cycle continues on and on across our families and communities in epidemic numbers. If an infectious disease were killing as many people a year, 40,000, and taking the lives of our children, we would never see this happen, right? We wouldn't let industry and special interest groups demand what research could and couldn't be done. And we'd never allow for our top scientists to be muzzled and to be taken off the case. So how do we address gun violence through the lens of public health? Firearms are a leading source of fatality in the US. They cause nearly 40,000 deaths per year and also another 80,000 non-fatal injuries that are treated in our emergency departments and hospitals. For every one of these events, there are countless more psychological injuries, including lifelong trauma among the individuals and communities whose lives are impacted. Us Oregonians are significantly impacted by firearm violence too, and that impact has been increasing over the past 10 years. On average, 500 Oregonians die and more than 1,000 are non-fatally injured from firearms annually in our state. And just to give a comparison, Oregon experiences around 350 opioid overdose deaths per year. Oregon's firearm death rates are higher than those in Washington and much higher than those in California. We have one of the highest suicide rates in the US and more than 80% of our firearm deaths are suicide related. Homicides, police involved shootings and unintentional shootings comprise the remainder of these deaths. Oregon is also the site of several mass shootings. Those are the Clackamas Town Center in 2012, which preceded the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary by just three days, and the Umpqua Community College in 2015, which have both left indelible marks on our state. And as many will remember, we are also um, the location of one of the nation's first highly publicized high school shootings, which occurred at Thurston High School in 1998 in Springfield. So we've had our share of police shootings as well, including the death of Jason Washington on the PSU campus, or close to the PSU campus, by PSU campus police in 2018, which we're still grappling with on our campuses to this day. So like other epidemics, gun violence, whether it's in schools, by police, or when it's self-inflicted, is predictable and thus it's preventable by applying our tools of public health. The public health approach uses the science of epidemiology to measure health problems, identify risk and protective factors for those problems, and develop interventions to reduce risk factors or to increase protective factors, and evaluate the eff efficacy, including risks and benefits and unintended consequences to various stakeholder groups of those interventions. In the past decade, enormous public health efforts have been mobilized to address the opioid overdose epidemic, leading to substantial decreases in the rates of prescription opioid-related deaths. And this includes a 38% decrease in Oregon. But in comparison, very few public health resources have been invested in solving the epidemic of firearm violence. In public health, we've applied the science of epidemiology to the study of injury and violence prevention. So if you're familiar with the classic infectious disease epidemiology model, you can envision how we examine the agent of disease, like the parasite that causes malaria, which is spread by a vector of disease, like the Anopheles mosquito, to a human host. And this cycle occurs over and over again in social or physical environments that are conducive to this transmission. In injury and violence epidemiology, we understand that the agent of disease is energy, whether kinetic, mechanical, or thermal, that's transmitted by a vector or a vehicle to a human host, and also in social and physical environments that allow this to happen. So by applying the classic infectious disease model to injury and violence prevention, 
first. We're allowed to envision how to intervene to stop this transmission at each of these points in the cycle, whether reducing the amount of energy that's transmitted, reducing exposure to the vector or vehicle, fortifying the host, or changing the social or physical environments in ways that can prevent injury, whether through policy or changing social norms, for example. For injury epidemiologists, instead of the infectious agent, we have an injurious agent, which in this case is the bullet. And we have the vector or vehicle of that agent, which is the firearm. We have hosts who are oftentimes members of vulnerable populations who are being injured, maimed, and killed by these bullets. And we have an unequal social environment in which a lack of opportunity or displacement or racism systematically keeps some in this vulnerable category. Maybe it's also lack of gun safety training or licensing or policies with loopholes or stigmatizing mental health that puts others in this category. But we can systematically study this and intervene what increases or decreases risks across our population, what policies work while maintaining the rights for gun owners, how can we engineer and disseminate smart guns that can only be used by a licensed owner, maybe, uh, or perhaps most importantly, how can we decrease those social inequities that put some children's some people's children at such greater risk of gun violence than others. But we have to demand that this research be done and we have to commit to the funding and to supporting it. This application of epidemiology and the public health model to injury and violence prevention has led to enormous reductions in morbidity and mortality over the last century, but primarily in the last four or five decades. And I just wanted to give some examples of this. Um, so, you look around and we see that our motor vehicle safety has vastly increased over the last four and five decades. We have speed limits that reduce the amount of energy that can be transmitted to the human host in the event of a crash. We have airbags and seat belts that make hosts, human hosts more resilient. We've developed a trauma care system that reduces the tissue or organ damage done by the transfer of energy from the motor vehicle to the human host. Another example is fall prevention. We have slip resistant flooring or building codes that prevent falls. We have soft playground surfaces and also bike helmets that make children more resilient if a fall occurs. And you can see hundreds of these examples all around us every day. And that's because there have been large public and private investments in public health and medical research that allows us to study and identify ways to make people and inherently dangerous products safer without necessarily banning those products. We're doing a lot uh, to get started on research on this issue at the OHSU and PSU School of Public Health and at the Portland VA too, which I hope that we're able to uh, discuss a little bit more later. But now I'd like to hand the baton over to Paul Boxer, who will talk to us about violence in the community and uh, among our law enforcement officials. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Kathleen, for that uh, very interesting presentation. And I should oppose, I should start now by uh, talking a little bit about my own personal experiences with guns, which I was not planning on doing. Um, I have some nicely written text here about my research and some of the work I've done. But um, since we're talking about guns and our personal connections to it, in full disclosure, I've never owned a gun. I've never held a real gun that I know of. Uh, certainly, I've never fired one don't have any family members who own guns. Um, and although my son is, is occasionally expressing interest in guns, um, I will most likely never buy him one, um, even though when he's older, he may purchase one for himself, that'll be on him. I live in New Jersey, not Oregon. We're a very different state. Um, in fact, as far as I can tell, um, if I'm recalling correctly from the last rankings that were done by some of the advocacy organizations, New Jersey is either the, the most or the second most restrictive state in the country when it comes to uh, our gun laws, the laws that we have on the books, as well as the effectiveness of our laws. Um, our governor just signed uh, in the fall a whole slew of new laws um, that, that strengthen that enforcement even more. Um, I assume will be number one sometime soon in terms of restrictiveness. So it's a very different culture um, that I grew up in. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I've lived in New England. I lived in the Midwest, um, uh, but I'm back in New Jersey now. And uh, it's, a, it's very much a different culture in terms of 
individual attitudes towards guns, how often people own them or, or talk about them, or certainly I don't see them in everyday life, except if they happen to be in the holster of a police officer walking through my community. So that's my framing um, in terms of how I, I, my framing in terms of my cultural upbringing, and in terms of how I think about guns and, and their role in society. I'm not gonna get into any advocacy in my presentation, but um, you may get a flavor of, of kind of what motivates the work that I do from the way I talk about it. So uh, let me just get right into it then. For the last couple of decades, uh, I've studied the impact of violence on child and adolescent development, uh, gun violence specifically, but also violence more generally. This has included violence across a number of different settings. So we know from research, for example, that violence in schools, in families, in neighborhoods, and the media can lead to a variety of behavioral and emotional difficulties for kids. We also know that ethnic political violence the violence accruing from higher level or ideological kinds of conflicts to an extent what we've been seeing on the streets of this country in the last uh, several days uh, also can lead to problems for kids who are exposed to it. We know that negative effects can result from direct victimization by violence, from directly witnessing violent events, and even from vicarious exposure to violence, hearing about it from news media reports or personal sources. Studies on the consequences of violence exposure suggest that it has wide ranging effects. Violence exposure can lead to emotional distress such as anxiety or depression or traumatic stress reactions, to behavioral challenges such as aggression and substance abuse, to impacts on academic performance and social relationships. Many of these studies have been conducted in the field with surveys or observations of kids in their natural settings, such as their schools and homes. And although this area of inquiry began with large scale one-shot surveys of kids, the research literature now includes a large number of studies that have used repeated assessments over time to show more causally the damaging effects of violence on development. Studies on the impact of violence in the media have even been able to use a stronger standard applying experimental designs to show, excuse me, that even brief exposures to screen violence can result in aggressive responding. So why does this happen? My colleagues and I, along with several other scholars in the field have typically thought about these impacts as accruing along two potential pathways that hinge on how kids cope with or otherwise respond to the violence they see or experience. We know as a starting point that violence is stressful, it's uncomfortable, and it demands some kind of personal response to manage the upsetting feelings that it causes. So we know that kids try to cope with violence when they encounter it, and we know that this coping can take a variety of forms. Kids might engage in a lot of emotional venting, aggressive acting out, or shutting down and distancing themselves. These negative coping reactions can become habits over time, patterned problematic distress responses, we call it an emotional distress pathway, or a non-emotional accepting and accommodating sort of response, a normalization pathway. Both of these paths can be quite problematic in different ways, but the good news is that we have effective mental health treatments available for kids whose encounters with violence are causing emotional or behavioral impairment. Of course, getting back to the point of our conversation today, violence is a public health issue. Given the scope and the spread of violence in our society, addressing violence solely through individualized clinical treatments is not going to be enough. For example, the last implementation of the National Survey of Children's Exposure to Violence found that almost 40% of kids had experienced some kind of physical assault and about 25% had directly witnessed some kind of violent act. So when we cast violence as a public health issue, we place a part of the responsibility for managing violence onto the broader community. We recognize that it's not enough simply to help individual kids who are affected by violence, but rather we must strive to reduce and prevent the violence that causes those impacts in the first place. And once we start talking about the role of guns in this broader context, the stakes get even higher. Guns make violence easier and more lethal, and they represent a really challenging continuity between the real world and the media world. Some scholars have even suggested that using guns in the simulated violence afforded by video games facilitates the use of guns in the perpetration of real world violence. No matter what side of the gun control debate one falls on, there is a general agreement regarding the importance of reducing gun crimes and gun violence in communities. And one striking phenomenon along these lines that I've witnessed in my own years of doing related work in cities and towns around New Jersey is that large scale approaches to dealing with guns on that level have largely occurred along two separate tracks. A public health or mental health sort of track, uh, as Kathleen was alluding to, driven largely by the medical and social service community in a given community, and a criminal justice track driven largely by the law enforcement community. It's important to bear in mind that the whole notion of violence being construed as a public health issue was a fairly deliberate attempt, in my opinion, to shift the management of violence away from the sometimes heavy-handed and punitive approaches of law enforcement and towards the preventive and ameliorative approaches of the health community. But it's really not an either-or issue. 
whether we're talking about violence in general or gun violence in particular, it's collaborative. I don't believe it's possible for the public health community to make a significant dent in the problem of violence without the deep intelligence gathering resources and critical enforcement role of law enforcement. Someone has to be able to provide general physical safety and surveillance, and someone has to be able to identify and remove seriously violent actors from communities. By the same token, I don't believe it's possible for the law enforcement community to create significant and sustained positive change in communities through their own strategies and tactics. And that might even be less the case right now at a point in time when police departments around the country really do seem to be facing a crisis of, of legitimacy. So it's critical that any community-wide approach to reducing and preventing violence or gun violence take into account the fact that both the public health and the law enforcement constituencies have unique and important roles to play and that those roles don't need to be played separately and independently. In fact, they can and should be harmonized. I've often imagined community intervention as a jigsaw puzzle. That's not a new concept, I didn't make that up. The idea of the jigsaw classroom for schools has been in play for decades now. The idea behind the jigsaw classroom is that for a given classroom activity, different students or small groups of students are provided with a segment or task that requires intergroup cooperation to complete. Each student or small group is thus one piece of the full puzzle, and only total cooperation will make the puzzle whole. I think communities can function in a similar manner when it comes to violence. Each segment of the community has a key part to play. By now I've worked with enough police and social workers to know that cops do not want to be social workers and social workers do not want to be cops. But both professionals have significant interest in stopping crime. Police can do this through targeted patrols and law enforcement and arrests. Social workers can do this through counseling, prevention and referral services and positive youth development activities. These are just examples. There are of course roles for teachers and physicians and nurses and public officials as well. But in the bigger picture sense, the idea is that we are very likely not going to reach significant reduction in violence without some kind of harmonization between the interests of law enforcement and the public health community. As a community cl clinical psychologist myself, I've worked with people representing public health as well as law enforcement, and I understand that each discipline has its own unique approach to the problem. And when they work in sync, change can happen. In fact, that's the model, that's, that's a model, that's one model uh, that's shown some efficacy over the years, but it's very hard to do, in part, I think, because of the bias inherent in bringing such disparate professional communities together, and also some of the, the challenges that come simply with instituting something new and novel. I'll end by just noting one moment that I often remember from my violence prevention work um, in a local urban community. Uh, I was having a conversation with a high-ranking urban police officer, uh, one of the members of leadership, and we were having a discussion around the kinds of interventions that my colleagues and I at Rutgers University were suggesting for the community. Uh, we were focusing on one particular uh, corner, one neighborhood, uh, and uh, we're describing some of the tactics that we wanted to try to employ. And this high ranking officer said to us, you know, we've been trying to stop violence at that corner for 30 years now. We've been doing the same thing for 30 years. Nothing ever works. And we sort of paused and listened we didn't push back on him at the time simply because we were new to that world with him and, and he was one of the higher ranking officers, but it occurred to us that if you're gonna be doing the same thing uh, for 30 years running, it might be worth uh, trying something new. And I think that's probably where we're going at this point in time with gun violence. It, it may be time to try something new. So with that, I will pass it along to Jeffrey Sprague. Thank you. Hello, this is Jeffrey Sprague. I'm a professor of special education at the University of Oregon and director of the Institute on Violence and Destructive Behavior, which is established in 1994 uh, under the, um, in, uh, the Oregon uh, Institutions of Higher Education. I'm gonna talk today about uh, gun violence in schools um, and along the way talk about the role of police and security technology. Uh, one set of practices uh, related to school safety is called threat assessment, so I'll address that. Um, a big factor in school safety has been identified as bullying and harassment, student to student and adult to student. And then I'll close with some comments about methods for treating antisocial and potentially uh, violent uh, youth in that regard. Um, I think it's important to start with a couple of thoughts. When people talk about school safety, there's not often a good uh, definition of that. Um, uh, after a, a tragic event like Thurston, as Kathleen uh, mentioned, uh, there's the issue of targeted school shootings, uh, mass shootings or individuals uh, hurting others. Um, frankly, uh, the base rate of those events, while tragic and completely unacceptable, are very difficult to do uh, 
research and to say we have made a dent in that. And I'm gonna talk about some of that data in a bit. So most of the school safety research is focused on issues like feelings of safety, uh, bullying experiences and school climate. And as we've heard from our first two speakers, those uh, preventive strategies are absolutely critical. And the, the main focus of our work at the Institute uh, here at the University of Oregon has been on uh, prevention. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to that a bit more too. So when, when someone says, I know how to make schools safer, it's probably important to bear down with them and say, what, what aspect of school safety are you, uh, are you working on? Um, there's been a history of school safety. Uh, Kathleen uh, brought us to that back uh, to Thurston. Um, uh, and earlier than that, we started our institute. Um, uh, 1992 is the highest level of violent juvenile crime in the United States, not in schools, but, but officially recorded crime. And uh, you may have re have recall a, a Time Magazine cover that um, predicted something called a super predator, which is gonna be an adolescent that was um, gonna come and ruin our communities in that regard. Interestingly, um, it's a controversial idea, but uh, 1992 is also 14 years after Roe versus Wade. And um, after that time, some people claimed it was the economy. Some people have a view that there were just fewer adolescents in the birth cohort uh, after that. And so crime uh, had continued to drop for a while. Um, it's, it's risen up a bit uh, in that regard uh, lately. What no one really anticipated were the mass school shootings of the mid to late 90s, including again Thurston in, um, in uh, 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 Springfield, Oregon, um, uh, Paducah, Kentucky, Pearl, Mississippi. Uh, probably the capstone of that era was the Columbine shooting. Uh, and, and so we, we began to see um, mass shooting violence perpetrated in, in schools, which perhaps had traditionally been viewed as, as safe, even sacred places for young people to attend. And so we started to see that response to mass school shootings, although frankly, most of the field didn't know what to do about a phenomena that we, that we had only begun to see emerge at that time. Uh, I often refer to our work as we're the, May, the you can be the Maytag repairman, the loneliest person in town if you're waiting for the next school shooting to occur. And so uh, we at the U of O began to work on uh, implementing and designing uh, prevention initiatives at the school-wide level. And in uh, 95 established uh, under the federal government, um, a center called uh, the uh, National Center on Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. And we've continued to receive funding there to promote uh, not only our own work, but uh, advocate for universal prevention is having a role in uh, violence uh, prevention. Um, we also started to see um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, a focus on uh, youth and child mental health. It's um, well documented in the literature that while the primary job of schools is not to provide mental health services, uh, America's schools probably are America's number one uh, children's mental health provider. Uh, by default, uh, in that regard, uh, well-established, underutilized, uh, uh, um, not because of lack of resources. I know Paul addressed this uh, some as well. And I will speak a bit later about the, the theory that the cause of a school shooting is mental health. Um, it's a little bit misguided as well. It's a factor, but it's, it's not a sole a uh, cause and can be used to dismiss um, uh, the, the the deeper issues again as Paul as Kathleen and Kathleen have already uh, shared with them. But we are seeing a lot of development, including locally, where the school can become the center for mental health support, whether the school is the provider, but it needs to be integrated as a community uh, response. And uh, Oregon has done some progressive work in that regard, making it easier for uh, child and family mental health services to be delivered at the school site or through the school site. So one-stop shopping, um, if you will. And then in the context of threat assessment, and uh, it, it makes probably logical sense if someone threatens to kill you uh, at school, that the school would want to um, provide some kind of sanction for that. The typical sanction would be getting expelled from school. And there's actually a federal law called the Gun Free Schools Act, uh, which has created a whole host of problems around uh, not only the rights of the student who's made the threat, uh, but but it's a, it's very complicated, very difficult uh, 
law and Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, has actually said in retrospect, he regrets um, uh, uh, allowing that legislation to be passed. Um, but that calls to, as we've also heard from some of our speakers, um, exclusion from school, either through suspension or expulsion, is also disproportionately applied to racial ethnic minorities in school. So it appears to be a strategy that would make our schools safer, but in the end, it probably does more harm than good, which is very, uh, very uh, difficult. Um, the mass school shootings have continued uh, uh, through the years. And in fact, 2018 uh, is the worst year on record, both for the number of incidences and for the number of young people killed in uh, US schools. And so um, uh, there's a, a recency effect when a school shooting occurs. It appears like they're on the rise. Uh, for years, we had said they're not really on the rise. They're fairly stable. But the last few years, uh, the 17, 18, 18, 19, and of course, the 1920 school year will be truncated because of COVID. But the, the shooting the incidents are actually uh, um, uh, may not be statistically true, but they appear to be on the uptick um, a bit. So the primary uh, cause of a school related homicide is firearm. That's what we're talking about today. Um, homicide is the second leading cause of death for youth aged five to 18 and only quote unquote one to 2% of those uh, deaths occur in school. So uh, we could say that um, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, some people say, well, schools are relatively safe. Uh, from my point of view, even one child losing their life in a school is completely unacceptable. And it calls that it needs to be uh, integrated uh, with a broader community uh, health uh, response. Uh, also by uh, teen firearm uh, deaths, um, uh, the overall rate is actually higher in rural areas. Kathleen alluded to that a bit, that our state is mostly rural. Suicide rates are dramatically higher by firearms in, um, in uh, rural areas and homicide uh, is a bit higher in urban areas. So, so uh, because they are a low base rate, it, it spreads in that way. So as regards intervention, uh, we put this panel together because we've all invested in the public health approach and we began to invest and promote that approach back in the middle 90s um, based on my attendance at a what was billed as the first ever National Youth Violence Prevention Conference in Ames, Iowa uh, with Al Gore and, and uh, Janet Reno. So uh, we're special education people, but we heard about this uh, public health approach and we thought, man, that's, that's a good way to go. So why don't we uh, see what that looks like in our work? So um, in schools, they wanna look at the design, use and supervision of school space and also the administrative and management practices of the school. So I wanna focus on those just a bit uh, one advocacy, particularly under the Trump administration, has to been to add more uh, police to schools. Um, it may be counterintuitive, uh, but there is really no research uh, suggesting that the presence of police in schools makes schools uh, safer statistically. I think it's an emotional issue. There is strong evidence that police presence greatly uh, increases racial disparity and arrest and other forms of interaction, as again, as Paul mentioned, we've seen in the news recently nationally. So police and schools tend to reflect the behavior in communities. Um, I think it's a difficult issue. My experience in schools is we don't uh, spend enough time working out with the local police or whoever the contracted police presence is, what their protocol, practice, and policy is. And so many of the mistakes that are made in my view, are an observation of people just not taking the time to uh, control uh, police behavior um, in that regard. A second piece is um, school security measures such as metal detectors and bulletproof glass are also not shown to make schools safer. A couple more points to make as my time runs out. Children uh, make threats often before they do a school shooting, but most of those threats are what are called transient, I'm gonna kill you, needs to be paired with, I've got a gun and a plan. Uh, by the way, most guns used in school shootings come from family members or people that the perpetrator is known. Uh, two more points to make. Uh, one of the major factors in school shootings is an escalation of dispute. 
and that's typically involved around unresolved bullying and harassment uh, by the uh, uh, shooter. And so much of our work is focused um, on that. Uh, just a final piece, um, as Paul mentioned and Kathleen, mental health uh, treatment certainly is is a part of the part of the the treatment and the factor there. Um, but uh, we need to more closely examine uh, the, the role of, of uh, exclusion through expulsion and suspension. So we may need to make a school safer by isolating a student for a, a time period. And there is a law in Oregon requiring that. Uh, but the expulsion of the ex suspension itself is not the intervention. It's just what we do till we figure it out. So uh, just in closing, we want to help schools develop a comprehensive school safety plan screen for and identify uh, behaviorally at-risk students, uh, work diligently to improve school climate, uh, including preventing uh, and responding to bullying and harassment, and support uh, antisocial and potentially violent youth. And we've made a lot of good strides, but we have a long ways to go as both of our previous speakers have shared. And now we're on to Allison Ander Anderman. Hi, I'm going to talk about local regulation for gun safety, why it's important, what the limitations are in Oregon, and what meaningful action communities in Oregon can do to prevent gun violence. So first, why is it important to allow local communities to regulate firearms? Well, first of all, local governments often act as incubators for novel policies. Practically, it's just easier to pass laws at the local level than the state. And because of this, local governments can try out new solutions to preventing violence. In California in particular, many gun violence prevention policies have originated at the local level. And after gaining traction locally, many of these policies went on to become state law. And partially because of this trend, California now has the strongest gun laws in the nation and one of the lowest gun death rates. I'm going to give you a few examples of laws that began at the local level in California, but are now state laws. And I'm using California as an example because it broadly allows local governments to regulate for firearm safety. So expanded requirements for child safe locks, laws eliminating bulk gun purchases, laws regulating ammunition sales, and prohibiting large capacity ammunition magazines all started locally and are now state law. In addition to being incubators for novel policies, local governments often understand the needs of their communities better than state lawmakers, and different communities have different needs. Um, as was alluded to earlier, um, dense urban areas tend to have more problems with interpersonal community violence, and in rural areas, gun suicides are more of a problem. And these areas can and should legislate differently. So what's the situation in Oregon? Can localities pass their own local gun laws? Well, the gun lobby has been working for the past several decades to remove the authority of local jurisdictions to pass gun safety laws. When a state removes regulatory authority from a lower level of government, this is called preemption. And unfortunately, the gun lobby has had success in Oregon preempting local governments from passing gun safety legislation. So without reading the long statute, I will just say that it is a very comprehensive preemption statute that really takes power away from local governments um, to regulate for gun safety quite broadly. There are some exceptions, however, and I'm going to briefly cover the ones that are most relevant to gun violence prevention. So cities and counties can regulate the purchase of used firearms by pawn shops and secondhand stores. And this is important because gun dealers are the number one source of trafficked firearms. Imposing reasonable regulations on gun sellers, even if they're only secondhand sellers, can prevent gun trafficking. Localities can also adopt ordinances that regulate the possession of loaded firearms in public places. And this is also important because guns in public spaces allow disputes and disagreements to become shootouts. We've seen that a lot recently. Um, and people are able to shoot first and ask questions later. But despite the gun lobby's fear mongering, 
Most mass shootings do not occur in gun-free zones, and the presence of guns makes it more likely that there will be a shooting, not less. Portland and Eugene have bo both have some regulations on carrying loaded guns in public by people who do not have concealed carry permits. Um, and a few of the exceptions to the preemption law have been developed by case law, such as allowing cities to prohibit concealed handguns on leased property, allowing school districts to prohibit employees from possessing guns on school property, and allowing the Oregon State Board of Higher Education to prohibit certain individuals from possessing guns in certain areas of the campus. Unfortunately, however, that's more or less the extent of the preemption exceptions, at least so far under Oregon's current laws. So in a state with comprehensive preemption like Oregon, what are some non-legislative actions that can be taken to prevent gun violence? Well, in many urban areas, as I mentioned, a significant amount of the gun violence is the result of interpersonal community violence. And community violence intervention strategies look at this type of violence as an infectious disease that can be treated and its spread can be prevented. And these particular programs work by focusing on using community members, incentives, and interventions to break the cycles of violence rather than utilizing criminalization. You may have heard about these types of programs under the names Cure Violence or Ceasefire. They have been tremendously successful at reducing homicide rates in large urban areas. And we have a lot of data on this on our web website, um, giffordslawcenter.org. Now, it appears from the data that gun homicide is not a particularly serious problem in Eugene, but Portland has had more issues with interpersonal community violence. In the first 10 days of 2020, there were 23 shootings, including one gun homicide, up from nine shootings at the same time the previous year. Now, Portland does have one of these community violence intervention programs. It's a hospital-based program called Healing Hurt People at Legacy Emanuel Medical Center. Um, but that was the only program that I was able to find of its type in Portland, which lead me, leads me to believe that the city could definitely benefit from expanded programs of this nature. Another non-preempted way to address and prevent gun violence is through gun tracing. Gun tracing refers to the process through which law enforcement identify the source of guns they find at crime scenes or elsewhere. And by sending information about the gun, law enforcement can determine which dealer first sold the gun and to whom. And this is a really critical way that law enforcement solve gun crimes. Unfortunately, the gun lobby has passed legislation that makes it much more difficult to trace firearms and share the data, but that's a topic of a different presentation. So tracing guns um, not only helps law enforcement solve gun crimes, but it can also show trends about where guns are coming from. Guns may be coming from outside the community or even the state, and uh, tracing allows law enforcement to see patterns and to identify dealers that are supplying crime guns. Um, there are some really good cases out of Missouri where tracing was utilized to um, uncover manufacturers and dealers who were engaged in gun trafficking and shut them down. So um, what can communities in Oregon do to utilize gun tracing? Well, communities can require law enforcement to trace guns and provide funding for the effort. And that can be passed by ordinance, but it is not likely preempted. Um, okay, and in, in addition to um, crime gun tracing, there are other types of ordinances that can be enacted in states even with comprehensive preemption. So a little over half the states have laws making a person criminally liable for failing to prevent a minor from accessing a firearm. Um, but Oregon, unfortunately, leads. But Portland does have an ordinance like that. The ordinance doesn't regulate firearms, um, but a person's conduct in relation to minors and safety, so it is presumably not preempted. Localities can also pass lie and try laws that require a dealer to report to law enforcement when someone fails a background check so um, officers can investigate whether a person lied about their prohibited status when trying to um, buy a gun. Um, even in Missouri, a state with very broad preemption, there's a lie and try law on the books. 
in St. Louis. And there's a lot of data uh, coming out about the effectiveness, um, especially out of Washington State, of lie and try laws. Um, another type of ordinance in effect in some states that have broad preemption are lost and stolen reporting ordinances, which require gun owners to report when they knew or should have known that one of their firearms was lost or stolen. And that helps prevent people from trafficking a firearm and then later claiming it was lost or stolen. And St. Louis, Missouri has one of these on the books as well. And um, cities can also motivate dealers to adopt best practices. Localities have significant purchasing power and um, they can interview gun suppliers to determine whether or not they follow best practices. And law enforcement can um, offer regular opportunities to dealers and their employees for training on how to prevent risky or illegal sales. Finally, localities can require school districts to send notices about the importance of safe storage of firearms and um, review with parents any laws that might subject them to liability. So what can you do in Eugene or other parts of Oregon to address and prevent gun violence? Well, first and foremost, vote. Elect representatives in your state who are committed to preventing gun violence. Um, second, lobby your city to establish community violence intervention programs or increase the funding to these programs. Third, lobby your local government to establish a robust and well-funded gun tracing program and continue to test the limits of preemption with novel ordinances and policies. Um, so one final thought is just that even in states like Oregon where there's um, comprehensive preemption, there is a lot that can be done to prevent gun violence. Thank you. So we've been asked to discuss a little bit about what each of us feels is um, the most appropriate starting point or a place where we have um, the possibility of um, reducing the numbers and impact of gun violence in our communities. And I'll go first. And um, the obvious answer for me, of course, is, is research because we need data and numbers constantly to inform our better inform our questions to inform our interventions and to understand if those interventions are having an impact. So we'll talk a lot about policy, but for me as a public health um, practitioner, I, um, I like to look at the, the full puzzle, full, all the pieces of the puzzle, including um, engineering, are there better engineering fixes? Um, what can we do to modify the environment to make it safer, um, to change the norms? Um, uh, to reduce um, perpetration of violence in the first place. Um, you know, what can we do with taxes, with economic incentives that might make a difference? Um, uh, mean safety in the provision of um, safe storage devices for firearms, uh, with, coupled with laws potentially. To me, the sky's the limit in the possible interventions that um, we can test, but we're gonna need the baseline data and we're gonna need to um, carefully construct research um, that can answer kind of, um, get as close as possible to the causal answers that we want. Does this intervention or does this policy work? Um, one thing that we're aiming for at the OHSU PSU School of Public Health is to develop a center of firearm injury research or center focused on gun violence prevention and gun violence research. And, um, you know, New Jersey and Rutgers is an example of a state that has um, supported this through state funding. California has also done that, and I believe Washington is working on doing that. So um, something that's near and dear to my heart, especially as an injury and violence prevention researcher, is to secure funding so that we can do the research that produces the data to answer these questions. And I'll hand it to Paul. Oh. Thanks for that. Um, well, Kathleen, you didn't leave me much room to offer more than that since you said the sky's the limit. So um, <laughs> it's true that uh, you know one point that maybe we didn't all 
um, hammer across very hard is the fact that violence, uh, gun violence specifically, but violence generally really is a multi-determined kind of phenomenon. Um, there's a variety of different ways to approach that problem. Um, the jigsaw idea that I, that I mentioned earlier is, is one way to, to think about how you bring all those things to bear. Um, but in addition to what the kinds of things that Kathleen mentioned, of course, um, I think I would lose my academic position if I didn't say that we needed more research. We always need more research and funding and, and good data to support the kinds of interventions that we might do. But to all of that, I'll add, um, I think there's a lot of merit uh, in place-based approaches to doing uh, gun violence intervention. And by that, I mean, rather than thinking about, of course, the important backdrop of, of regulations and laws and policies and that sort of thing at the political level, um, it's important to be, uh, I think as well, very hyper-local in the way that you approach gun crimes and gun violence. So we know, for example, work that we've done here in Newark, uh, in nearby Jersey City, um, a lot of the problems with violent crime and gun violence are very uh, geographically uh, concentrated. Uh, so they're not citywide. They're not every street that you go down has some kind of issue happening. They're very much uh, focused in certain areas. And there's a lot of different kinds of things that can be done by ways of environmental intervention, um, changing the way communities look, um, fixing things like broken uh, streetlights and, and uh, dealing with uh, abandoned properties and cleaning up um, vacant lots and that sort of thing. But then also um, ensuring that uh, various kinds of social, educational, therapeutic services are proximal and available in communities that can uh, benefit the most from them. Um, and then, you know, changing the, the nature of the uh, kinds of patrols that police might do in those in those areas to make them feel a little safer um, and deal with problem deal with the problem of gun violence in a much more concentrated uh, physical space as opposed to sharing spreading resources out um, over a large uh, urban uh, or rural or suburban area. Um, Jeffrey, what do you think? Yeah, specific to schools, I, I think some of the things I mentioned, but just to, to anchor, we've seen a big resurgence um, in a focus on uh, increasing the capacity for schools to provide mental health supports, and yet there's little to no guidance or adoption of, of the evidence-based work. I know, Paul, you mentioned uh, uh, treatments that are known uh, to be effective, and related to that is in the context of threat assessment, only one state in the U.S. actually requires reporting of the outcomes of those threat assessments is Virginia. And we've learned really a lot about that. And where that leads then is to say what's most likely happening in Oregon as in elsewhere, if a student makes a threat, they're probably suspended or expelled uh, with little or no follow-up or treatment, uh, which only leaves, uh, I will hate to say, but I'm going to a smoking gun. Uh, the Parkland shooter had received uh, several levels of treatment, but really refused uh, access to all of those. And so that coordination. And then I think uh, two more pieces. One is, again, as I mentioned, to, to be clear about the role and utilization of security personnel and security measures. There's good research on that. And much of that is ignored, I think, because it feels like there's this, if there's police presence, the adults may feel safer, but the kids probably don't. And, and it's ludicrous to think that you can respond to a, an active school shooting by having a single uh, officer on on campus uh, in that regard. So I'll stop to give Allison some time there and thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, so I think that one thing that we probably all can agree on is the importance of background checks and ensuring that people who are prohibited by law from purchasing or possessing firearms do not have access to them. Um, Oregon is one of the states, one of the 21 states that have closed what we call the private sale loophole. Um, federal law requires background checks on um, purchases from a gun dealer, but not from private sellers. And approximately 21 states and the District of Columbia have stepped in to fill that, uh, close that loophole by requiring background checks on purchases between private unlicensed individuals. But um, the way that background checks are implemented is um, actually uh, really determinative of how effective they are. And one thing that we know is that when background checks are implemented via a gun purchaser licensing or permitting system, where every person needs to obtain a permit or license to own um, or purchase a firearm, that um, background checks are more effective when implemented that way. And um, we've seen some really dramatic results um, in states that have licensing. So, for example, Connecticut enacted its licensing system in 1995. And uh, that law was responsible for a 40% decrease in the state's firearm homicide rate and a 15% decrease in its suicide rate. 
And conversely, when Missouri repealed its licensing law in 2007, its firearm homicide rate increased by between 17 and 27 percent, and its suicide rate increased by 16 percent. And there's a lot of data to support the um, effectiveness of licensing. We put out a new report recently um, called the Case for Firearms Licensing that contains a lot of that information. So that would be my recommendation. I had a question um, uh, that came up as you were talking, um, both Paul and Jeff. In the healthcare setting, we're talking a lot more about trauma-informed care and um, thinking about ways to better deliver care through a trauma-informed lens, both at the VA um, as well as OHSU, where we're treating the and other sources of violence. Um, are there people talking about trauma-informed education and trauma-informed law enforcement too? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Oregon uh, legislature actually funded a, a small, project in two high schools uh, trying to understand how trauma what people call trauma-informed care can be implemented in schools. Um, so there are actually uh, books and a lot of advocacy for that. It may be subsumed within the constructs of mental health treatment and that sort of thing. The observation I have at this point is, um, like some other op intervention approaches in schools, it's to be a uh, and it can also be overwhelming to educators. In other words, we don't want teachers to feel like they have to So the, the role and the structures to make those um, evidence-supported practices in place um, still haven't been worked out in schools, but, but I believe that the good progress is being made in, in that regard, as well as some of the research. Uh, I th think that uh, trauma-informed policing is certainly a thing. I don't think it's often referred to as such. Um, but I do think it's something we're going to be hearing about more um, uh, as events that are happening right now in cities all around the country play out further. Um, in a number of cities, um, for example, Minneapolis is actually one of them. There are a handful of cities in the national um, initiative to try and improve police community relations in part by um, exposing uh, police officers to educational materials around the historical traumas associated with racism and slavery and issues affecting uh, black and brown communities, black communities in particular, um, to try and provide uh, the police with a better framing and context for understanding the, some of the communities that they might be um, serving. Um, so I think that that certainly is a trauma-informed approach and really been referred to as such. Um, I think trauma-informed care, uh, you know, the, the, the term has been around for quite some time now, but I don't think it's really been until the last maybe five or six years or so that, that we've really seen real meaningful um, changes in the ways in which um, different systems handle that. Um, you're, you, I think Allison uh, spoke earlier about the hospital-based uh, violence intervention programs. That is a trauma-informed approach. Um, there's plenty of research showing that victims become offenders. So if you're going to provide services to victims adequately, you're very likely preventing uh, another crime uh, down the line, more violence down the line by doing so. And that, is, that also is a trauma-informed approach. Did I get that right, Allison? Yes, sorry about that. Yes, absolutely. I think we have enough now. <laughs> this has been our June 12th program, Gun Violence, a Public Health Crisis. Before we proceed, I'd like to recognize some gold sponsors. Pacific Cascade Federal Credit Union, Gatos, Churnside and Balthrop, Dr. Sandy Ibarra of Hearing Associates, and our Sapphire sponsor, Summit Bank. Support for the City Club comes from Summit Bank, your local community bank. An independent community bank headquartered in Eugene, Summit Bank serves businesses and professionals in Eugene, Springfield, and Central Oregon communities. For more information, visit sbko.bank. It is our expectation to have these taped conversations available by Fridays at noon. We wanna thank you all for supporting us during this difficult time. Before we thank our speakers today, there are a few quick announcements. Thank you to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, PAC Info and Simplified Computing, LLC, Dot Dotson's Photography, and Network Charter School. And a special thank you to public radio station, KLCC 89.7, for airing City Club programs 
on Mondays at 7 p.m. And thank you to Community Television of Lane County, Cable Channel 29, for televising recent City Club programs. Next week's program will focus on the local response to the coronavirus pandemic. The vigorous community-wide effort to slow the spread of the virus achieved its goals thanks to clear directions and broad cooperation. As we enter phase two of loosening restrictions, local leaders begin to focus on long-term recovery. What can we do to ease back into a normal that works better for all of us? Lane County Administrator Steve Mokrahiski and Eugene City Manager Pro Tem Sarah Madera will join us. More details and information about future programs can be found online at the City Club of Eugene's website, cityclubofeugene.org. Once again, I would like to thank today's speakers, Kathleen Carlson, Paul Boxer, Jeffrey Sprague, and Allison Anderman. Thank you for a very compelling session. This concludes today's program. Be well and stay safe.